is Damien from Marketing Food Online. In today's podcast, we are going to cover cottage food laws in the state of Texas. Let's get started, guys. All right, so let's get right into it. So I've had a lot of inquiries uh, lately about cottage food businesses actually as a whole, to tell you the truth. Um, many of the different cottage food laws throughout each state, of course, vary. Um, but the, there's a basic underlying kind of a, of a rule, if you will, that, um, of course, potentially hazardous foods such as time or temperature sensitive foods, uh, meats and those types of things um, are always going to be prohibited from cottage food businesses because there is a certain type of handling method, certain type of prep that goes on prep work. And that needs to be done in a commercial facility. So uh, with that being said, though, you're not really limited in a lot of different ways because of the variety of products that you can make from a cottage food business. But do keep in mind that every state uh, has its own laws in regards to cottage food business. So this podcast, I'm going to cover some of the basic understandings of what you can and can't sell, where you can sell it, some of the licenses or permits that you may or may not need to have. Um, And of course, I'll have in the description down below links uh, for specific states. So what you will have is uh, the ability to take a closer look at your state. And then uh, keep in mind, the really unique thing, though, about cottage food businesses is that local municipalities, um, counties, um, and cities and counties can actually create and have in place certain regulations or certain laws um, about cottage food businesses. And that can vary even more so. Uh, reason being, of course, that those municipalities have the ability to do that on a local level. Of course, states have a, kind of an underlying uh, bill in place that is set for cottage food production. But when you get to um, your local city or local county, you might, to, you might need to also double check to verify if there's any additional types of, of zoning questions or uh, licenses or permits that may be needed in addition to uh, on a local level. So please do keep that in mind as well. So let's get right into it. So Texas um, has a really good, um, actually really good law in place in regards to cottage food business. Right now, currently, you can, make, you can sell up to $50,000 from your home with food products that you produce uh, from your home, which is quite quite a lot of money for as a part time you know uh, as a part time food business on the side especially if you're looking to just get into the food business you've never done this before starting at home is always a great place starting small and local it's going to give you an opportunity to understand the ins and outs of not only just running your own business but starting a small business, um, selling locally so you can see how it is to actually interact with customers, um, selling food products as opposed to other types of retail products. So it's always a good thing to start small and, and continue to think big you know, and, and develop your food product, develop your processing, develop your business skills, and then going into a commercial facility obviously would be the next step up. So um, one of the biggest things, the interesting things about the cottage food laws in Texas – is that there is um, there's no specific licensing needed to do it other than the uh, food handlers training course. There is a course that you need to take. It's a food handlers course, and it's a it's a great course to have. To be honest with you, so you can understand the the handling of food, the prepping, the packaging, the bagging, the labeling, um, and, and it's a really great course to take. Um, not every state requires it. In the state of Texas, they do ask that you do get a food handlers course. Um, the thing about it is that there's no license required necessarily from a Department of Agriculture or anything of that sort. So that is one thing that you don't need to have right off the bat. Now, I would highly recommend, of course, you need to be uh, incorporated as a business. That is kind of from a legal standpoint, I would recommend that you do. You need to incorporate yourself and get insurance, food insurance, to protect your your personal as well as your, your – to separate your private from business – assets in case something were to happen from a legal standpoint and then of course to protect yourself uh, and your business from a business standpoint to make sure that you are covered by simply having a a cottage food um, insurance policy for the food prep that you're going to do okay so what type of what type of venues what type of places can you sell okay so roadside stands are a great one um Certain areas, of course, based on zoning, they may not be that close to your home because of the zoning issues. So there there may be some farm stands or roadside stands that, of course, have to be permitted and licensed by the the county and the states. And they need to be in areas that are relatively not going to be residential areas just due to zoning. But you can sell through those. Um, Farmers markets that you can do as well. 
Um, you can actually sell products from your home, but remember that the customer would have to come and pick them up or you'd have to make that direct sale in person. It's not something where you can ship it out to them, even within the state. Uh, shipping as far as um, a, a mail mail order type of business, that's not something that you can do. Uh, you do you can deliver it, um, of course, if you were looking to have a product that you're producing from home. If if you're in a position to do that, delivering it directly to the end user that is allowed. Now, some of the prohibited ser- services and, and and methods to sell, of course, is online. Uh, you can't create a website and sell a product online, and even if it's within the state, you can't sell a product through your website and ship it to them. It has to be delivered in person, and, and that is something that's kind of challenging when you want to grow online. You'd really need to focus on a commercial facility as opposed to being in a home-based business. Um, restaurants and retail stores, of course, that is a third-party seller, so that would be someone where you would sell that product to a restaurant, and the restaurant would then sell it to a customer. There can't be that middle band uh, between your product when it's homemade Uh, between your product and your end user, your end customer. So do keep that in mind. Of course, retail stores act very similar as well to restaurants. If a retail store sells a product to a customer, again, they're a third part. They're in between you and your customer, and that's something that you can't do. Now, um, when it gets to the the thing I wanted to mention about the events, um, uh, sales cannot be made at at other events. The, The events locally have to be uh, refer to kind of like a county or nonprofit events, fairs and festivals and such. And those are places that you can you can go through. If you're looking to do the farm stands, just keep in mind you want to make sure that that farm stand, of course, is licensed and it has a, has its proper permits or licensing uh, based on the county's regulations when you begin to sell at those. Now, what kind of a food, what kind of foods can you make? Well, actually, the list is quite quite long, to be honest with you. It's quite a bit. Um, it's very similar to most of the home home food businesses in other states. Uh, cookies and cakes, uh, breads and brownies. You're looking at scones, fudge, truffles and candies, uh, brittles and things. Uh, those are always popular uh, at farms and fairs festivals when it comes to um, the fall season and winters. And those are really, really good sellers. Um, nut butters and pickles and mustards and vinegars. Um, even dry goods. Um, when you talk about coffee beans, you can do those. Um, you're talking about herbs, herb mixes or seasonings, which are hugely popular. Uh, dried fruits, uh, tea leaves. Um, this would actually be uh, dried tea leaves, of course, not those that you dry yourself, uh, but you have to actually have to get dry, dry leaves. You can get them in bulk, do a blends or mixes, mixing them and then selling them. When it comes to uh, pastries, you could do anything from um, danishes to pies, co- uh, cones. You can even do um, fruit butters, jams and jellies. Uh, when it comes to preserves, those are always popular gifts, and those are always popular items at, at farmer's markets and, and roadside stands and such. Um, when it comes to snacks, this is also a big, big, huge list. Uh, nuts and seeds, as I've mentioned in other states, you can do those, and, and the variety of flavors and such that you can package is gigantic. So the market is huge for that. Granola, um, caramel corns, chocolate-covered items, um, <clears throat> excuse me which would include things like pretzels or marshmallows, uh, graham crackers, Rice Krispie treats. Those are all great for chocolate covered. Those can be sold. Now, getting into a real brief list of the things that are kind of prohibited just due to the production and how they're made because you've got to be really careful. Um, things like salsas, sauces, ketchups and juices, uh, jerkies like dried meats, those would have to be done in a commercial facility, uh, pasta noodles, ch- um, chocolate covered fruits, uh, candied apples. See, these are things that would be really, um, there's the processes to make them. That is what is really the restriction on it because you got to be really careful when it comes to acidic foods. If you come to bacteria growth, those are things that can happen with these types of foods. So you got to stick to that non potentially hazardous food um, list and uh, kind of not deviate from it because you don't want to get someone sick, of course. So now you're probably thinking, okay, so I'm going to use it, I'm going to create a, a food business from home. So what kind of equipment can I use? Because, you know, you hear a lot of different stories about using large equipment, commercial equipment, of course, not being allowed. So commercial equipment is not is prohibited. It's not something you can use. What is commercial equipment? Well, when it comes to those oversized commercial mixers, uh, the dough mixers, when you talk to f- walk-in freezers, refrigerators, those require a certain type of, of electrical ampage, okay, electrical outlets, and they're not something that you can just plug in at a home. So those are, those are things that you don't want to bring into a home setting, a home kitchen, and then try to figure out how to get that up and running. You really need to stick to equipment that is used in the home. Uh, kitchen, you know, KitchenAid, to be honest with you, KitchenAid mixers are 
are perfect enough, they're big enough for doing uh, this type of business from home without getting into a huge, huge production and investing. Um, <clears throat> um, you cannot use an inspected uh, commercial kitchen to prep your product. So this usually means that you know you, utilizing a home kitchen for your food prep under the cottage food laws is really what you need to stick to. Um, when it comes to the sales, of course, all the sales have to be person to person. They have to be in person. Uh, you can't re, they can't be resold in order for it to be resold, like at a retail store, as I mentioned before. Okay, um, and of course, the sales limits uh, right now for the state. Uh, this is uh, no matter what part of the state that you're in is around fifty thousand a year. Again, not bad extra additional income from a food business. So the thing you do have to take is a accredited training program. It's a food handlers course. And the, the cost for that vary. It could be anywhere from like 15 to 20 bucks. Uh, I've seen on the high end of about $50, but those usually don't cost, but about 20 to maybe $25 for those courses. And it's really going to teach you some, some information that you would need. Even if you progressed into a commercial facility, having that understanding of how it works on a small scale uh, can be incorporated on a big scale, but you need to have the basics understood. So, Let's see, what else, uh, the last few things that you really need to focus on. When it comes to the label requirements, you want to make sure there's a few things you need to have. You need to have the name of your business. Of course, you need to name the business when you incorporate. That has to be on your label. You need to have the product name. So obviously, if you're making chocolate chip cookies or chocolate-covered pretzels, that needs to be on the label, okay? You need to also have a statement declaring that the product is produced in an an uninspected (laughs) kitchen. So... What that means is that you need to let the customer know that you are operating from a cottage food basis. You're not a commercially um, inspected facility by, by a Department of Agriculture or Health Department. That's not what you are doing. That lets the customer know that you are working out of a kitchen that is not necessarily inspected by any one of those agencies. Uh, the business address, this would actually be the address of where you're making it. So if you are incorporated, you're, of course, you're working out of your house, your home address would have to be present on that label. Because you also need to have a traceability. they got to know. If someone were to get sick, they need to know where, where was the product made from. So then they can investigate and double check and make sure that the processes were done correctly. And, you know, you don't want to get people sick. And you got to have uh, an ability to trace it back to an address. So, well, with that being said, there is a handful of other items that you can definitely check up on. I wanted to run over some of the basics and get you, give you some basic understanding of what is needed and what you would need to do to get started. In the description down below, as I mentioned, check out those links. Uh, read out a little bit more about it. I've got a great link right to the Texas website that talks all about cottage food law and cottage food business. And again, as always, I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to keep it short and sweet and to the point. And if this was uh, helpful, I do always appreciate big thumbs up. Give me a big like. I appreciate that. If you have any questions about cottage food business in the state of texas uh let me know down below and i'll get to it as quick as i possibly can and again you guys need to check out i put together a fantastic cottage food step-by-step uh video seminar that i have on my on my uh, marketingfoodonline.com website and it's an instant download it's a seminar it walks you through it it's a great resource to get up and running it took some time to get all of that information together and it Um, I'm really proud of that video, and I'm really excited a lot of you have been getting it. If you haven't got your own copy, download it, get it. It's definitely a resource worth having, and it's going to help you out tremendously. So uh, with that being said, I'll wrap it up, talk to you guys on the next podcast, or see you on the next YouTube video.